Hello, and welcome to the ALN Thursday at 4. I'm Nick Kenoki, the producer of ALN Thursday at 4. And uh, my host today, my guest host, is Jack Dempsey, and he'll be talking with Keith Cunningham. Uh, one note before we begin, if you have any questions, please put them in the chat, and we'll get to answer them in the last five minutes. And without further ado, Jack Dempsey. Thank you, Nick, uh, and, and thanks, uh, thanks for inviting me back to, uh, to host uh, this, this event. Uh, I'm Jack Dempsey, Senior Fellow at Asset Leadership Network, and I'm here to introduce uh, Keith Cunningham, the, uh, the man of the uh, half hour. So, Keith, I'll hand it over to you for your, your introduction. You'll do a much better job than I will. Well, I have no uh, official affiliation with ALN, um, so uh, I just work at GAO, Government Accountability Office, uh, for seemingly ever. Uh, 22 years now. Most of that, uh, I've been working on real property issues. So I kind of know where the bodies are buried on this issue. Uh, if you don't know who GAO is, we're the research arm of the United States Congress. Uh, so we try to evaluate federal programs to make sure they're efficient, you know, they're using the taxpayer dollar efficiently, that they're achieving the goals they were designed to achieve, and of course, always keeping an eye on fraud, waste, and abuse. Uh, in the real property area, uh, a lot of my work deals with GSA, of course, uh, but all the land holding agencies, except for DOD, we have a different group which handles them. So Department of Energy, VA, uh, Department of Interior with the Park Service, um, and really even down to the cats and dogs, Smithsonian, and even the Kennedy Center, which only has one building. Well, th thanks, Keith. And I think it's important. Um, I mean, GAO is, is such a... I mean, it's such kind of a, a leading source for good, objective, honest information, critical information, very important to organizations trying to do a, do a better job. But before we get into the good stuff, uh, I, I mean, I think it's always kind of interesting. Uh, first of all, by the way, compliments to the bow tie. Um, I feel a little underdressed at the moment, but it, it's always good to understand, like, I mean, how did you end up with GAO and, and what, what kind of fills your passion there? I mean, you guys do a lot of really important work and you have some really good people there and it's it's good to know you a little bit more on a personal level sometimes. Uh, sure. I grew up in Fairborn, Ohio. Um, the Fa Fairborn, Ohio's claim to fame is uh, the wright Harrison Air Force Base. Uh, people think it's in Dayton. It's not. I can tell you from my bike school rides, it's in Fairborn. And so everybody in Fairborn touches that Air Force Base. My dad worked on the Air Force Base for 40 years. My mom taught in high school right outside the Air Force Base. And all of my friends were either on the base or, or with people who were supporting the base. And so when it lost its strategic air command capability, when I was just a kid in middle school, everybody was afraid the base was going to close. And let me just say that when the parents got together, there was a lot of go play, we have to talk. And it was all, I could just, you know, I could feel the tension in the air. And so from that moment on, I, I was really into federal infrastructure and I, I knew how important it was to my hometown. And so I, I took that knowledge and I actually parlayed that into a job in Germany. And for two years, I worked for a UN think tank studying the uh, demilitarization after the Cold War ended. And I got, to, I got to travel to all of the NATO and Warsaw Pact countries and see what they were doing with their military bases. Uh, those people weren't as lucky as Fairborn, Ohio. Uh, they actually had their military bases closed. And so we tried to find something good to do with them. After that, I went to, you know, that's kind of a, a limited, uh, once they stop closing military bases, your, your, your job opportunities kind of dry up a little. So uh, from there, I went to Johns Hopkins, studied uh, urban planning, and turned that into a job at GAO, looking at real property issues much more broadly than just DOD. That kind of brings me to today. Excellent. I mean, it's, it's always interesting. I mean, there's, there's always kind of like a why story there. And, um, you know, and, and those experiences we have sometimes early in life really kind of um, uh, set things up in terms of um, fuel our passion. But let's hear about today. Uh, you guys just reported or just completed a, uh, a recent report on the federal property profile. It kind of went through a lot of, a lot of good details. Um, it seems like a good place to start the conversation. Great, great. This is a report that um, I've been wanting to do for a long time. Uh, you always hear about the real property data and really kind of the poor quality and the poor reliability, but we were lacking those, those examples which catch people's imagination. And, you know, you can give stats and you can, you can 
you can say things, but if you can show somebody, I've heard it's worth a lot. So uh, Jack, if you'll humor me, I'd love to give you a little test. <laughs> I'll do my best, I'll do my best. Okay, can you see that? I can, I know what that is. What is that? Those are water towers. Not according to the real property profile. Um, hmm. Me and my team took a drive around rural Maryland. We took the FRPP, the real property profile, and we went to, uh, gosh, almost every federal site in rural Maryland. And this was one of the first places we stopped. That's my little team standing out in front of what is a water tower. But <laughs> in the real property profile, this is listed as a GSA office building. So you can imagine if you're like the, the Federal Real Property um, Reform Board and you're, you're, you're trying to find good assets to sell to the public and make the government some money and you go, hey, we've got just outside Bel Beltsville, Maryland, a big office building that's completely vacant. And then this is what you find. Hmm. So you can see that it's kind of, it, it might be funny, but it also hurts people. Okay, next test. Okay. Well, you're fine. Go, go ahead. If you find right, like? right, right buyer, you know, but go ahead. I'll try to do better this time. What does that look like? Uh, looks like a lawnmower shed uh, on the it's, back of a shed. Yes, it's a toy shed for, for the daycare center that is located uh, a Goddard, Air, a Goddard um, Space Flight Center for NASA. And NASA lists that little shed, not the big shed next to it, the tiny little shed as a warehouse. Hmm. So, um, yeah, so when we when we tracked this little tiny warehouse down, we were kind of surprised to see it only holds children's toys. Well, I mean, don't you get credit for little people, little warehouse? Does that, does that work? I don't know. It, it, <laughs> I guess I have a warehouse in my backyard, too. <laughs> okay. okay, next one. Just two more. Okay. Humor me here. Okay. Hmm. Um, I'm kind of stumped. It looks like it could be a, an office building of some sort, um, a place where I'd go and get a new ID or something like that. Um, <laughs> a little dilapidated. It though, is but... not the set for The Walking Dead, <laughs> but it would be better as the set of The Walking Dead than what it actually is which is a NIST um, office building warehouse. And the reason we were surprised to see this building in this condition was this building was listed in the real property database as being fully occupied and in excellent condition. And I'm only lucky that we went during the winter because once all the uh, leaves on the streets, it would be like a hidden building. And we were able to peer inside of the windows and the, the ceiling has completely collapsed. And so it's not in good condition. It's not fully utilized. As a matter of fact, it is kind of used as a warehouse around on the side of the warehouse, though they've put all the stuff that they want to put in the warehouse outside of the warehouse because it's actually safer outside than inside that building right now. Well, I'm claiming I got one out of three. So, I mean, I don't know how you're scoring, but I'm thinking I'm, I'm, I got a chance here. I think you do too. And, and here's the last one. And this might be the toughest one of all. Oh, I'm going the wrong way. There we go. Oh, that looks like a, uh, uh, either a house, but obviously there's, a, there's some uh, equipment on there. So it looks like a command and control center, I'm going to guess. It is. This is listed in the real property database as an FCC uh, top secret monitoring station. Hmm. And guess what? I get it. It is. It is. Okay. I'm claiming, I think I got that one right too. That's what I'm going to claim. I just wanted to include one thing that when we pulled up to it, we're like, really? But this one actually panned out and turned out to be exactly what it said it was. And so it's not all bad, but a lot, a lot, a lot of the things we saw just were, were absolutely not right. Um, I'm going to go back to stop sharing now. And so the problem is that the people know on the ground, the people at NIST, 
the people at Goddard, the people that they know what they have, they know the condition, they know if they can actually store things in it or not. But so often people above their level want to also use this data. And even once you get outside the, the fence line of Goddard, people don't know what's there. And so they rely on the data to tell them what's there and to give them ideas about what could be what they could use it for and and what they could and if they could dispose of it or not. And if the data is not good, it's it's useless to them. And we found and this is really a stunning stat. So we looked at specifically at addresses because the first thing you need to know about a building is where is it. And we found that 67% okay that's over 400,000 assets have either a wrong address, an incomplete address, or an address that was formatted in such a way that it couldn't be read by a computer. So 67% of the assets in the federal property profile can't be found using, you know, using just like plugging them into Google. So, so there's, there's two build up questions I have on that. Um, the first one is, so what? So why is this important? Why, why, why do people need to know this information? I mean, and, and second part, which is maybe part of the answer too, is, um, I mean, this is a requirement, I'm assuming. I mean, I think, I think it is, but I think that's your it point is. here is. So it's hard. This is a question I get all the time. Who uses it? Well, I think this year we have a really, really great example of who uses this database. So uh, the Federal Asset Sale and Transfer Act FASTA was passed a couple years ago, and they finally constitute the board. This is the civilian BRAC. And so uh, the, we just have great names for these things. Um, the Civilian Real Property Reform Board, I think, is we're going to call it the FASTA board. Mm -hmm. uh, they were tasked with finding high value properties that were in the federal inventory that could be sold and they could make like $500 million. We know the assets are out there. And so the key is to find them. And they tried to use the FRPP. And so they, first of all, they couldn't find most of the assets because most of them have a bad address. And then when they went to the ones that were supposed to be in good condition, they weren't. And when they went to the ones that were supposed to be fully occupied, they were vacant. And so they spent months, fruitless months, trying to use the federal property database to, to actually manage federal property using only the variables which were supposed to be in the database. They weren't trying to find some pie in the sky thing. These were address, condition, and utilization. These are all variables that are already in the database. And so one of the things they found, they only had six months to do their job. And if you spend three of them on a database that doesn't help you do your job, it really puts you in a bind, which is exactly what happened to them. Uh, other people that want to use this data all the time are GSA, OMB. There's a regulation that says when you need a new, when, when you need a, a new um, space, the first thing you have to do is look in the federal inventory to see if somebody else has that space that you can sublease or take over. And it's impossible to do that task right now because the data isn't where it needs to be. We found, we found, this is years ago, I don't know if it's still true. We looked at Philadelphia and uh, San Antonio. And we found enough vacant go government owned spaces in both of those cities to handle all of the lease space in both of those cities in their entirety. So, so, so they, I guess so, so good, good data is important here. And, and they're it's, it's, they didn't even know it. And we don't, and I guess in, in some of this is we don't even know all the, the reasons for it. There's always, there's always a concern about um, security and, um, you know, telling too much information, but I guess some of that's being worked out. Is, is there, did you guys look into that too, in terms of what information yes. should yes. be? It's almost like you read the report, Jack. Uh, uh, yes. I, I took a look at it, but <laughs> tell me more. <laughs> the security was one of the most frustrating parts of all for me. Um, I feel it's a crutch. Um, I think we could, I think we, or I think our report proved it because they would say, oh, we can't give you the address. That's sensitive. 
the Goddard, all the buildings in Goddard were all too sensitive. All the buildings at FCC, every single FCC building is too sensitive to have an address in the FRPP. So we said, okay, fine, it's sensitive. So if you put in Goddard into Google Maps, what do you find? The address. What do you find when you put every single FCC, including the secret one that I just showed you? You find the address, a picture, usually a map of the, in, of the, of the entire facility. And so it's not like they're hiding it from anybody. They're only hiding it really from legitimate use and from, and from analysis at a government-wide level. Hmm. So I felt like, and, and these, these sources are FCC, and they're the, they're the actual agency themselves. In each instance, we found that the agency on their own website had the information that they said was too sensitive for the database. Go figure. But, but it's, I mean, so, so GAO, you guys have a knack for figuring um, these kind of inconsistencies out. And I know many, many agencies have, uh, have um, worked with you and, and I think in some respects appreciate. Um, it's always a difficult thing. How hard is it, do you think, or, or what's going to be involved in, in fixing this problem? Or what, what steps are out there or what should agencies be thinking about um, to, to make things better? I think everybody here wants yeah, to make it better. Yeah. I'm happy you said that because the, the people whose job it is to, to work the data, they're not idiots. They're not lazy. They're trying their very best. Uh, they're under-resourced. They are... Um, often saddled with, with, with antiquated computer systems or worse, like a bunch of different real property data systems that they have to try to make talk together in some way. And so they always have a ton of challenges. And um, there's this thing called the Federal, Federal Real Property Council. Um, it's an organization of all the real property agencies. They all send a guy to the meetings or a woman and and they try to work these problems out. And they have a working group that is, they put together specifically on the data issue. And they invited me over last month to talk about our report. They were overwhelmed. Uh, they saw that number 400,000 addresses that need to be fixed. And they were just like, <laughs> yeah. yeah, you know, and they're like, well, what do we do? And so we, we, we were able to come to a, an agreement. We kind of worked through and brainstormed some solutions. And one of the solutions that I think is going to be a little sticky here is that we start with the big stuff. Mm -hmm. um, buildings that are over 5,000 square feet. So we're not talking about these little shacks like this picture I showed you. We're talking about the big ticket items. Let's start with those. Go down your list. Make a draw a line at 5,000 and let's check the addresses for the ones that have more than 5,000 square feet. Second, let's look at ones that are on inside of a, of a fence. If it's on a big facility, we don't know, need to have the address of every single one. Those are more than the public needs to know. How about the front gate? How about if we just give the address of if you're a part of someone from the public and you want to visit that, where do you go? Let's make sure that address is in there for every single one of the buildings inside that fence line. And so once we started, once we came to those two agreements, we go, okay, now we've taken a problem which was insurmountable. And by tackling the most important first parts first, you know, now we're talking about a few thousand government wide, a few dozen, a hundred or so per agency. Mm -hmm. Suddenly it doesn't sound so overwhelming. I think they're going to do it. I, I think, I mean, there's obviously been uh, positive progress here. And I think your report is really going to, is, is helpful. I mean, it's a little bit of a, a prod, but it sounds like you guys are, have had some really good conversations with Federal Property Council, uh, GSA, and it sounds like things are, um, you know, continuing to move in a positive direction. It kind of leads us to a, a big question. I know at the beginning of each Congress, or um, you know, in this case yeah. will be the new mission, um, the GAO has a high risk list. And this has yeah. been um, just really a bastion of, I think, I think very helpful structure. I mean, it's, so we're expecting a, an update to that soon, or, or can you tell us anything about that? Yes, yes, I'm excited to say that the real, proper, uh, the real property high risk will be uh, able to vote in this year's election. Uh, it turns 18. <laughs> 
Okay. Um, so, uh, so way back in 2003, uh, we put real property on the high risk list. And the high risk list is in a collection of the 34 things that the federal government has that are at highest risk of fraud, waste, abuse, or mismanagement. And I've always appreciated federal property being on that list because it puts federal assets where they should be. One of the most important things the federal government has, the, one of the most important things it does, every single one of the federal government's missions is impossible without these assets. They can't do anything. So, so to, to, to kind of like back page them, it always seemed like it's, it's frustrating, right? I'm sure it is for you in the work you do. And so we want to, I mean, we're raising it up in a, maybe not a great way, but we're, I'm getting a phone call. Um, but we're, 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 putting, we're putting it in the importance that it belongs. And um, each year we recognize the progress that the government makes, but also we continue to hold their feet to fire on, on all of the uh, reforms that they need to make. Well, I imagine so. So I mean, so it's 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 too early to release any information. And I know you guys have a, 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 a you know an important and deliberative process to make sure that you've kind of addressed all things in the appropriate manner. So I think I think all of us are going to be looking forward to an update there. I know I um, I can't say I, I, I wait at the door for it to show up my at my doorstep, but I but I do when it's released. It is one of the documents I do go out and look at because it's it's, it's very formative. And I think not just is it there's details in there, but it's it's telling people about what what's really important what seems to be when you look at, at everything and that's um i've always found that helpful both as a as a federal employee and as a, a person um, working for uh, federal clients um but i think but but so as that moves along and you got these reports that are happening you got the uh, high risk list that's kind of developing um you guys are a branch of, of congress i mean you're kind of helping out um you, you kind of look around you check on things i mean is there any uh any headlines you can give us or news yeah. breaking, newsworthy things? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, one of my UCR reports, um, mm -hmm. that's our most public service that we offer and, 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 our, and our public, but we do a lot of technical assistance and technical assistance doesn't re result in a report. It's basically members, chairmen, staffers calling us up and asking us, for um, advice and analysis and quick turnaround stuff. And a lot of that is around uh, bills that they're either introducing or, or considering introducing. And, and I think I, there are a few bills that I'd just like to say that are kind of bubbling their way up, so to speak. Please, please let us know, Let's, this is the good stuff. <laughs> First one is uh, foreign ownership. Uh, a few years ago, we found that unbelievably the a, a, a lot of our high security, first of all, it's weird to have high security space in spaces that federal government doesn't own. You got to get your head around that in the first place. Most all FBI field offices are in leased space. And so the question was, who owns this space? And, and at the end of the day, lots of times it's hard to tell, but it's foreign entities. Sometimes it's okay people like Canada. Sometimes it's not okay people. China, uh, Koreans, even iffy Israel. Um, uh, and the problem was, it's not a problem to have foreigners, but it's a problem when they don't know. And so we came up with a recommendation that said, GSA, you need to figure out who owns these. And if it's a foreign entity, just tell the tenant. So they can put it in their risk analysis, right? Yeah. GSA kind of drags its feet. And so now Congress is going to take action. And this it actually the Foreign Ownership, the Secure Federal Leases Act has passed the Senate and is up for consideration in the House for this Congress. It could pass this year. And I would imagine it has some good uh, bipartisan support on that, which is it does. It, it seems, yep, seems obvious to me. Uh, the second one is um, the uh, so the federal government, we've never been great at managing our money, but in real property, we really don't manage our money well. Um, we spend 
so much money in the federal property on interest payments. Like, let's pretend you don't pay your credit card every month, Jack. You just let that interest just roll up. You spend yeah. more on interest than you do on whatever you bought. And right now, the federal government does that with, uh, with the finishes on leased space. Um, if, uh, you know, the pension benefits guarantee corporation want to move into a space and it's not configured properly and they, you know, they need some walls put up and some finish, they don't have the money to do that. So mm -hmm. they just roll it into the lease. The owner needs to finance that. So they go and get a loan to do that. And then they pass that and a little extra onto the, onto the federal tenant. And it's rolled into a 10, 15 year lease. You can just, the interest ends up being more than the finishes themselves. And we pointed this out. We said, you know, they've got this federal buildings fund sitting there. It's got almost $8 billion balance in it. Seems like a little bit of that money could go a long way in reducing these interest payments. And GSA, again, didn't have the ability to do that. So they have, um, hi, Nick, I see you. Uh, and, uh, and so Congress is going to step in and give GSA the authority to use some of those balances, which are just kind of sitting there, uh, yeah. to reduce the, these payments. It's a great idea. Very good. So great discussion, guys. I just want to be aware that we don't have too much time left in our half an hour spot, and I want to respect people's times. I would love to ask you a few questions, Keith, if you are willing in the closing minutes. Um, the first question was just, what is the name and number of that report, that GA report that was referenced? Um, crap! I got I got it right here on I my got, uh, share GAO, screen. Uh, GAO twenty tech one three five. That will uh, that will bring you to that report that we talked great, about. Great, great. Thank you for that. Just for clarity. Um, and then so there was one question from David Packerar uh, with the Department of Homeland Security HQ, and his question was based on the current trend of data quality improvements, if any. How long do you estimate it would have it would take to have the real property data quality to a level that can actually lead to informing business decisions? Yeah. Um, okay. So I don't think it needs to be a hundred percent. You know, I kind of felt bad after a lot of the people on the federal property council read our report. They they thought we were asking for perfection, and we're not. We're looking for an eighty percent solution here. So I would say. You know, DOD has a plan right now. Their, their data has also been deemed unreliable and they have a plan for 2020, 2022. And so they think that they can have all their reforms in place, ready to go, thumbs up on the data by 2022. And I think that's a good goal. We're never looking for immediate solutions. This is a little bit of a, um, maybe a, maybe a urban legend that GAO wants fast answers. Uh, our criteria for recommendation implementation is four years. So we don't count any action until after four years. So we're looking at the 2016 recommendations right now. Has anything happened? Have they been implemented? So as far as I'm concerned, for a, 2000, for a 2020 report, we'll give you to 2020, 2024. Gotcha. That makes sense. Um, again, gentlemen, just because we're short on time, I'd ask you to you know, make a closing and then I'll show those slides that I wasn't able to at the beginning. Uh, mine's easy. Uh, thank you, ALN, for uh, putting these up uh, every Thursday at four. And Keith, thank you for coming. And I'll last word to you. Great, great. Hey, I've looked forward and I see that we have a ALN virtual conference coming up soon. I think I'm even on the agenda there. So I'm excited about that. Awesome. Well, uh, along with that, I have um, just a slide to say thank you, Keith, uh, Assistant Director, Infrastructure, USGAO. Uh, Jack Dempsey, our first actually guest host. Thank you for doing that with Definitive Logic, Director. Pleasure. Um, and then here's our little Restructuring America. That's the 2020 Asset Leadership Forum. Uh, you can register at assetleadership.net. Um, and without our, our organizational members, none of this would be possible. Um, thank you all so much for being here and we'll see you next time. Thanks everybody. Thank you. Jack, hope to see you soon. See you soon, be safe.